I, a very good evening from India to both of you. And it's once again great to see you both. So uh, I am Dr. Sayan Day, Assistant Professor from MIT Law School, MIT University, Noida, and I'm here to deliver uh, a lecture on the topic in search of decolonial turn in Indian academia, a multiversal shift. Uh, the very basic perspective of this lecture will be to explore the various possibilities of how to decolonize the Indian academia from various dimensions, for example, from, uh, the, uh, from the perspective of infrastructures, from the perspective of the syllabi, from the perspective of the pedagogy and various other elements. Now, uh, before I move ahead uh, with a very uh, plan of this lecture, I wish to uh, brief, briefly talk about the very Indian colonial story and how the colonization, the process of colonization, especially uh, the British colonization, because it was for the longest duration in India, how did it initiate? Now, uh, usually when we look into the history, the colonial history uh, of India, usually the perception of define the, the perception of divide and rule comes to the forefront. Uh, but it is important for us to note that uh, even prior to this, uh, prior to the uh, implementation of the concept of divide and rule, uh, the concept of design and rule, and it was presided by the concept of design and rule and define and rule. So uh, the, when the British arrived in India, uh, they realized one thing that uh, keeping in numbers, the keeping in number of the indigenous natives at the backdrop, it's not easy to come and simply uh, physically uh, dominate the Indians and develop an empire, which basically or mostly happened in the continent of Africa. So what they have to do here is uh, they have to make sure that the concept that they have to make sure that the colonizers are able to convince a section of the Indians of the, a, a very uh, small number of educated class of Indians that existed in uh, pre-colonial India. It is important to convince them that why colonial rule or colonial empire is important for them. So that is how they first designed the idea of establishing colonial regime. And then it was followed by the defining rule, the process of convincing the people that why modern Western Eurocentric colonial modern education is important for them and why their indigenous modes of education is inferior to the other forms of education. That was the second part of this uh, policy that is the defined rule. And then comes the question of divide and rule, that division that caused you to, uh, through geographical divisions, cultural divisions, ideological divisions, uh, linguistic divisions, and several ones. And uh, this actually enabled the British to create a lot of different forms of fragmentations, violent fragmentations like uh, linguicides, then we can talk about epistemicides, then there were genocides, uh, there were culture sites, etc., where the cultural divisions took place, violence of culture, violence of the physical violence, then uh, geographical displacements, ideological displacements, uprooting indigenous cultural beliefs and practices, indigenous traditions and, and customs, and so on and so forth. And this is why Mahmoud Ugandan thinker, uh, Mahmoud Mamdani, uh, says that it was a new form of colonial governmentality to understand the nature of native Indians and the social beliefs. So it happened uh, like a very systematic, it was a very well researched and a systematic project, the, colonize, the process of colonization in India, and which actually success, quite successfully created a colonial utopic world, which actually Walter Mionolo, Argentine uh, decolonial uh, scholar Walter Mionolo, Professor Walter Mionolo talks about the promised land of happiness. Obviously, virtual happiness of paradise was created by the colonizers. Very successfully, they generated this colonial utopic world, which motivated a certain section of the Indian society who actually uh, voiced for the existence of the colonizers and tried to 
uh, channelize, advertise, and impose their ideologies, their thoughts and ideas on the other Indians. Uh, so, uh, keeping this very basic argument at the backdrop, my uh, the very three basic objectives of this talk will be that how the various forms of indigenous knowledges, which have been uh, which have been totally uh, subjugated at the time of colonial era, could be revived, could be reassessed and revived in various ways and how to erase the impacts of cultural distortion and the evacuation that basically uh, took place at the time of uh, the colonial era, during the colonial era, and how to overcome that. And the third one, uh, which is important, is how to culturally uh, empower the various modes of education in both generalized and specialized terms. Education for the sake of uh, destroying the hierarchies of knowledges, education uh, for the sake of establishing cultural universality, education for the sake of sustainable development and not for generating hierarchies and creating violence. Now coming to the very first part of my talk, the perverse logic of academic uh, colonization. Uh, now, how did the British first authenticate the concept of the importance of colonial modern English education in India. So we have to go back to the Macaulay's Minute of Education dated February 2nd, 1835. Now, if we carefully read Macaulay's Minute of Education, we find, and if you look at the language he has used there, the way he has tried to uh, prove that why English education or widely Eurocentric education is uh, superior than the indigenous modes of education in India very clearly says that the usage of mother tongue in India is weak and it is not capable of generating uh, scientific thoughts. It's not capable of generating uh, logical ideas. It's not capable of generating globally uh, relevant perspectives. So for that, to generate scientific studies, to generate scientific thoughts and actions, to uh, make India a modern country, English is very necessary. So that is how the first usage of the language English started, logically started in India. Now, obviously, this created a complete social fragment. This fragmented the society into two parts. One is the, that is the abyssal thinking. Now, abyssal thinking got very much injected. So abyssal thinking is how the society was divided into two parts. One is this side and that side. So this side is the part which actually supported the colonial perspectives, the colonial ideas and the colonial uh, activities and actions. And the, that side is the other part of the Indian people who totally resisted to the colon imposition of colonial thoughts and actions. And obviously they were uh, subjugated in the process. Now, this also led to the creation of the zone of being slash zone of non-being. The zone of being and the zone of non-being, which Franz Fanon uh, talks about in his works, in his work, The Wretched of the Earth, where he says that how knowledge was commodified, objectified. This knowledge is not treated as an open area of discourse. Knowledge during the colonial era no more existed as, an, as a free exchange, but it was basically uh, made a monopoly of the colonizers, the way colonizers uh, idealized knowledge, the way colonizers generated knowledge, the way colonizers produced knowledge, presented knowledge, that was gen that was actually regarded as the marker, that was actually regarded as the kind of measuring stick that how modern knowledge should be channelized across the group. And in this way, knowledge became a commodity, a colonial commodity. The next important point is how the colonizers, uh, in order to convince, again going back to the point of design and rule and define and rule, how the colonizers basically uh, tried to wear the mask of indigenous people and try to convince them that you see why the colonial knowledge is important for you and how it is superior and in what way it is going to develop you globally. That is what uh, Professor uh, Sabelo Ndelevu Gatshmi, uh, a decolonial scholar from South Africa, talks about epistemic, ontologic, and linguistic ventriloquism. That is, you 
hide your real colonial face and then you wear the mask of the indigenous people and try to pretend that whatever you are doing, you are doing for them. And that is how a major section of the Indian people got distracted towards the distorted knowledges generated by the West. And then the archive of colonial logic, that is how, if you see the way Western knowledges were produced and generated in general, you see how the indigenous knowledges from various indigenous parts of the world, non-Western parts of the world, for instance, the, how the not indigenous knowledges in India were trafficked to, to the West, they were distorted there, they were dis distracted there, and then they were processed, colonially processed, and they were again brought back to India and imposed upon the natives. And they generated a whole structure. They came up with an entire package, a package of libraries, academic curriculum, uh, institution, institutional ideologies, political ideologies, and various other perspectives. That is, they generated altogether an archive of colonial logic so that even when they physically don't exist, at least their ideologies, their perspectives, their practices, their uh, thinking and doing patterns remain active among the ex-colonies. And that baggage of discipline is still what we are uh, continuing with. And so, obviously, this baggage of discipline led to the problem of internal colonization, the practices of inclusivity and exclusivity, some of the instances which I have cited here. For example, uh, the low caste, the people, the so-called Dalits, were not allowed to get educated. Uh, one instance that did, during the Peshwa rule in Maharashtra, even during the 17th and the 18th centuries, you see that how the low caste people, the Dalit people, uh, they were not allowed to get educated. And obviously the caste division, usually a confusion prevails that whether the caste division is a, or the class division is a colonial element or it is a pre-colonial Indian uh, aspect. Obviously the caste divisions and the class divisions existed in pre-colonial India, but there are several historical, uh, historical sources, genuine historical sources reveal that how caste and class divisions in pre-colonial India were very fluid, though they were assigned in biological terms, but they were quite fluid. One caste people playing the role of the other caste people based on their knowledge, based on their capability. But that was totally destroyed, that that fluidity was completely disrupted during the colonial rule. And so uh, we see that even during the Peshwa rule in the 17th and the 18th centuries, when the colonial rule was gradually, the British colonization gradually becoming very active in India, the low caste people remained submerged. Till 1855, there were no schools meant for the low caste, the outcast people are the Dalits. Now, even uh, from the concept of the secretary of the British Indian government, the schools for the low caste people were opened, but it was just a kind of political show off because the caste issues were left ignored. Teachers were not recruited properly. The low caste people, they were threatened by the local goons uh, who were mostly Indians not to go to the schools, otherwise uh, they will be physically, sexually, and various other forms, they will be harassed. And so this, the problem of separatism and the poor attendance rate was very much high. So it continued from the very pre-colonial era to the colonial era, where even during the pre-colonial era, you see there are instances where the outcast people had no restrictions in gaining knowledge. But during the colonial era, the situation became more politicized and where you see a strong restriction uh, is kind of being practiced, a strong kind of class, uh, class fragmentation where being practiced by the colonizers. And uh, gradually when you look into the academic institutional structures in the contemporary era, you can never ignore this colonial undertone. For example, uh, just a very few instances I have picked up to uh, support my argument, for instance, the academic positions. If you look in most of the institutions in India, for example, the principals, the vice chancellors, the directors, the coordinators and other job positions, you will, you, you, you will find one thing that most of these positions are being held by the high caste Brahmins. The high caste Brahmins, this, this practice which actually initiated at the time of the colonial era, where the high caste people, where the class fragmentation was further, the caste div divisions were further encouraged, you know, to fragment the nation further. Where the Brahmins and the other high caste people were given some high posts and the low caste people were totally put into ignorance. 
Next is you find the fetishism towards skin color, where you see the racial undertone, the colonial racial undertone is still so active. You look into the family life, you look into marriage alliances, you look into the workplaces, you look into uh, the unofficial criteria of, you know, you know, putting uh, unofficial criteria of having a person or the chance of having a person getting hired in a workplace or in an academic space is where the skin color also the skin color and the physical outlook very much close to the colonial physical structure really matters. There is a fetishism towards the fair skin color. Then you see the gender discriminations in the educational institutions and the official workplace of the colonizers where you know, official workplaces like the colonially uh, influenced institutions, the Again, coming back to the academic institutions where you see in terms of increments, in terms of salary structures, in terms of promotions and various other elements, the participation of the women are still considered in lower number as compared to the male counterparts where women in many, still there are lots of posts, academic and non-academic posts, which are uh, exclusively and quite officially considered that they are meant exclusively for men and not for women. And then you come to the class differences, that is the, the rich versus laborers, the urban versus rural people. And that gets very much reflected when you work in an academic institution through the behavioral patterns, through the attitudes towards each other, to the salary structures, through the increment patterns in various other ways, where you see people's, people's uh, behavior towards each other are very much uh, influenced by their, uh, by their caste identity, by their class identity by their religious belongingness by their physical features so these are some of the very prominent colonial undertones which we can see now why do i say that these are colonial undertones i have some uh, statistics to prove it now uh, this left hand side this advertisement is of a fairness cream which is very uh, uh, famous in india and uh, at the same time uh, people usually uh, use this Ad advertisements like this basically keep on authenticating the concept that why fairness is important. They keep on building and manufacturing the logic, the colonial racial lo lo logic of fairness, of fair skin, and why it is considered as an epitome of beauty. Uh, on the right hand side, there is an in uh, interesting uh, statistic that is a distribution of the selected government jobs in 1912. So we see that, for example, the deputy collectors in 912, 77 were Brahmins, 30 non-Brahmin Hindus and 15 Muslims. The sub-judges, again, it's dominated by the Brahmins. The non-Brahmins were only three. Muslims were nil. District Munsirs, again, 93 were Brahmins. Non-Brahmin Hindus were 25. Muslims were two. So such different statistics exist, which actually shows how the British actually uh, use this colonial division, the caste class division in India and try to channelize it in every box of our existence. And the picture in the present 21st century is not very different. On the left hand side, we see the gender discrimination in India. That is uh, the percentage of women earning not earning an income, the percentage of illiterate women, the percentage of women with poor health is always by default more than men. On the right hand side, we see the enrollment, the job enrollment as per the data in 2016, three years back, in fact, 2015, 16, four years back. It's not much different. To 2012, the general caste people, 53.2%. In 2015, 16, the enrollment in case of the other backward classes and in case of the scheduled, uh, scheduled castes and the scheduled tribes increased, but still we see how the general caste people are dominating by default. <clears throat> so what, keeping these arguments and the statistics at the backdrop, so what are some of the challenges of the university education that contemporary India faces? So first is the lack of free pursuit of knowledge, which actually Membe, says that the salesman proficiency where 
knowledge is not seen as a kind of exchange, as a free flowing exchange. Knowledge is not seen as something where we can all sit together to agree to disagree, where we can all openly critique each other, where we can all openly argue with each other. Rather, it is seen as a kind of, a kind of you know, marketing unit. It is bought and sold by standard units, measured and statistically counted. And that we can see, uh, like for example, in Indian universities, we have something called the API structure. The API structure, which basically shows that how, uh, that you need to have this number of publications, you need to have this number of conferences, you need to have this number of uh, engagements with different committees, which are, which has no connection with your academic system. And then on that basis, you get a promotion or you get your, an increment in salary which actually gradually keeps you diverted, uh, digress from your academic associations, your research associations. But the, the next, so this is how the statistically, how the academic system is statistically structured. The mania for assessments of the methods of faculty evaluation. So as I was saying that the conferences, workshops, papers, projects, committees, so, so the focus is more on the quantity rather than on the quality, which is quite alarming. And as a result, what happens, the rush to achieve those API points, those uh, measurement points in order to get a good job or to get a good promotion or to get a good salary incrementation. What is happening is the very basic quality of knowledge is getting disturbed. The very basic quality of knowledge is actually uh, getting bothered. And as a result, uh, at the end of the day, we don't see genuine research works, we don't see genuine paper publications, we don't see genuine or new ideas coming up. What is happening is repeated works are coming up in different languages and different forms. And that is how the students, my third point argues that converting students into customers and con consumers. Students, rather than looking at the students or you know, having a connection with the students as a kind of knowledge exchange, the student faculty relationship is more of a customer consumer relationship. So uh, with the burdens of the semesters, the assignments, what happens is on a regular basis, you see the universities under the name of continuous assessments, which sounds actually uh, very nice. It sounds like a very unique idea, but what you see is there's so many continuous assessments and continuous assignments that, uh, it leads to substandard plagiarized works. It demotivates the students too much of academic pressure. And what happens instead of research or original works, what is happening in research is becoming synonymous to repetitive search. The same kind of works, the same kind of activities are being generated and produced in different sentences, different forms. Thesis after thesis are being produced just with paraphrasings from various other thesis works. So substandard plagiarized works are uh, another point of concern. And another, the last point which I have argued here is gaining colonially trafficked knowledges. That is how the raw materials from the various indigenous parts of the non-Western world are being taken, are still being stolen. They're trafficked to the West. Then in the West, they are being censored. They are being plagiarized. They are being distorted. And then Finally, they are brought back to our country under the name of high quality works. And in India, still universities prefer that they, in the name of high quality guidebooks, in the name of high quality research, by default, it is a reference to the West. So this is how, and their works, the, the, the irony is, uh, we are reading our own indigenous works. In a lot of cases, obviously not in every case, we are reading our indigenous works, indigenous cultural uh, research works which are being generated in the West rather than in our country. So this is another major point of concern. It's important uh, to uh, take into consideration why it is happening. Now, uh, so what could be the possible solutions? Obviously, uh, it's not a one day thing. It's not a one day effort. So that comes to the brief second part of my talk that is decolonizing the Indian academia, a multiversal shift. So some of the probable initiatives which I have argued here is the democratization of access. Now, we have to see what is this democratization means because this is again a very problematic term. 
Now, uh, what I have argued here is dismantling the Euro North American centric C. The capital C center has to be replaced with multiple centers with small C. We don't, we have to negate the colonial. The C is significant. I have put it in single quotations because the C is significant for the center. The C is also synonymous to the colonial center. And creating multiple indigenous centers. For example, we need Afrocentrism, Asia centrism, South American centrism, India centrism, Argentina centrism, South Africa centrism. We need this provincialization of the knowledge system is very important. And then is the deracialization that is where knowledges can be generated without the consideration of the skin color, without the consideration of your physical features, without the consideration of your geographical belongingness, but based on the capability of your knowledge production. Multilingual modes of discourses is important. Social cultural narratives, various forms of indigenous social culture of narratives that has been subjugated, uh, that have been sub subjugated at the time of the uh, colonial era needs to be revived. And in this way, we need to be transcontinental bridges where reciprocity, uh, reciprocity is also very important. We need to give each other a feedback. We need to critique each other knowledges. We need to argue with each other so that new concepts, new perspectives come to existence. And for that, we need a collective effort, a transcontinental, a multicultural, a transcultural effort is very much required. It's not a singular element. We need to join the way the colonial effort was like a transnational element where different colonial countries joined together to uproot our indigenous knowledge system. Similarly, is a counter argument. We need to join hands together to promote pluriversality and border thinking without uh, without uh, dreaming to be a part of the colonial center, but creating knowledges across the border and connecting with each other. So the second point is what we need is the reprovincialization of the West. That is dismantling the colonial myths. Now here I have used the concept of the Tower of Babel must fall. Now this Tower of Babel is very symbolic because it is the from the <clears throat> concept of uh, if you see the biblical notion of the Tower of Babel where the diversity of language, the linguistic diversity was considered as a punishment of God, punishment of Almighty. Similarly, the colonial, like the Tower of Babel, with the passage of time, the colonizers, through various theological, scientific, literary arguments and logic, they have generated different forms of colonial citadels, the citadels of colonial logic, which are still very well preserved and maintained across different parts of the world. Those citadels need to be shattered, broken, and uprooted. And for that, we need to behave the five European horses of global slash colonial knowledge systems, Greece, UK, Germany, France, and Italy. Most of our theories, most of our philosophies usually come from these nations. And any kind of new propagations, any kind of new perspectives, it's by default, it is expected that should be underlined, should be argued based on these particular theoretical propositions, which needs to be uprooted. Now, the Europe and the Euro sponsored colonial institution should be more be the collective central, should not, should no more be the collective central authority. It is important to remember that uh, there is a small mistake in the slide I see that it has written should more, but I uh, say sorry because it should be should no more. So, should no more be the collective and central authority. So, we need to, as uh, Sylvia Rivera Kusikanqui says, that we need to uh, break the colonial palaces. We need to break the think tanks of colonization. So the Europe and the European spon Europe sponsored institutions, the widely the Western sponsored institutions should no more be the collective central authority of knowledge production. And for that, we need the recognition of the border thinking. That is what Boaventura de Sousa Santos says that we need to erase the colonial cognitive empires. We need to uh, promote colonial cognitive, we need to promote decolonial cognitive justice. It is all kind of injustices that has been done in the process of a thing. The way the colonizers have captivated our mind and forced us to think in their manner rather than thinking our own independent ways. And that has to be done through various ways. That comes the question, then comes the question of pedagogy. If we come, if we just take the colonial, uh, if we take the academic institutions into consideration, for example, the methodologies, the classroom teachings, 
we need more contextual stories where every student coming from every individual coming from different cultural geographical social backgrounds can relate themselves to what they are learning the field works the indigenous knowledge systems need to be revived the process of learning should be more on the context space rather than just on the text space so instead of moving from text to the context so what i argue here is we move from context to the text and that actually gives us the relevance of the knowledge production that helps us to understand the relevance and the irrelevance that helps us to understand to develop our own self uh, to de develop various forms of self arguments where we can argue in our own way rather than just mimicking somebody else's arguments in our process of learning and for that uh, we need epistemic decolonization that is right to think the freedom to write freedom to produce our own theoretical arguments freedom to communicate and freedom to interpret the, we need to, in the process of that, it is also important for us to overcome the racial melancholia. That is a racial sadness. It's a naturalized state of existence that the non-Western world is inferior and the Western world is superior. This by default concept needs to be erased. Somewhere, somewhat, many of us have actually agreed with this. So we always live in this, especially in the academic world where you see there's a massive fetishism towards publishing one's own articles and books by the so-called established Western publication houses rather than going for local houses and get it locally channelized. This is a kind of racial melancholia which I have identified in the process of my experiences of my works, of my decolonial engagements. That is where by default we realize that yes, if we have to have a high impact factor publication, if we need a good work to be globally channelized, those certain number of publication houses are the only options for us. And we naturally think that our country, our geographical regions have lack in good publication houses and good publication houses by default means the Western established ones. We have to, we need to come out of it. So the outcast practices, this is a kind of outcast practice, the transcultural confusions that it generates then hierarchizing interdisciplinarity in the name of interdisciplinarity, we see Western disciplines once again dominating the non-Western indigenous disciplines. Then the sympathetic readings, that is where you try to keep on inferiorizing our own indigenous knowledge systems, our own indigenous perspectives, and we keep on celebrating the superior of the Western knowledges. And the third and the last uh, part that comes is the decolonizing the normative foundations of theory. Now in India, initiatives have started, not in large numbers, but still the initiatives have generated. For example, uh, where efforts are being made to move away from the universal, unidirectional approaches towards knowledge production and generating, uh, lear unlearning the colonial aspects of knowledge and generating different forms of universal ideas, decolonial critique of dominant knowledges. For example, there is this concept of theater of wool, which is uh, a tram theater project in New Delhi, where a group of theater artists, you know, to make the process of, you know, to make the theatrical practices and open for the common people, for the open for everybody in the society, uses everyday household objects for presenting their plays. Now, for example, if they are present in the play, the different types of objects that are on stage, theatrical objects that they, that they are using are something from the regular household objects we use in our daily life. That is a theater of wool. Where, and these kind of theatrical activities are open for everybody, from small children to elderly people. Now, this is a way of de-hierarchizing theatrical practices where you don't sit in a hall where you don't sit in a hall where the seating arrangements are not based on the amount of money you are able to give for the tickets. And uh, it's a, it's an open space is taken. Most of the times it's, uh, it's an open air theatrical practice where people can freely come and join and watch this place. Then we can take the example of Kochi Binale, which is actually an art and cultural initiatives 
that happens once in every two years in the state of Kerala. Where you find, like for example, I was there in this 2019 version of the Poche Penale, which basically started in the year 2018. And there you see that they basically uh, develop various forms of arts and architectural styles in broken shattered houses. So there is this almost uh, a century old Jewish uh, town in Kochi where they, ha they hired those dilapidated broken buildings. And within those buildings, they create various forms of artistic works. For instance, this year's theme was India's partition. So what they did is, for instance, in one of the rooms, they have used uh, the cow dung water and they have put on fresh cow dung. They have taken up broken chairs. They have put around the rooms different types of broken agricultural objects, then dried straws, burnt straws, which actually creates that emotional impact that how uh, violent, how problematic, how critical was the India's, uh, was India's partition story with broken chairs, how agriculture was affected, how common people were displaced from their regions, how they were forced to desert their houses and various other belongings and simply run away overnight. So there are various other examples like this where within a very natural, broken, shattered environment, they create different types of artistic works, which actually helps you to get emotionally connected to the very theme. And also as a novice, as an individual, even if you don't know the historical background, but somewhere, somewhat through the musical, uh, through the mu musical element, through the visual uh, artistic creativities, you can easily feel the emotional connectivity, you can easily feel the emotional aspect of the artistic work. And there are several other aspects which are been several other artistic, uh, cultural, academic, extra academic uh, works are being uh, initiatives are being undertaken in order to decolonize and de-hierarchize the systems of knowledge production in India. And coming to the last uh, part of my uh, talk where modernizing, instead of modern colonial knowledge production, what we are looking forward is the modernizing, decolonizing the Indian Academy, a language with a homeland, where we need a language that is associated. Now language here is Obviously, the linguistic form on the one side and the other side is the language of a mode of uh, a medium of connectivity, a medium of connection towards each other. So uh, Peruvian author Gamaliel Churata uh, says, talks about this, the language with the homeland, which actually uh, various institutions, various organizations in India are trying to initiate it through their uh, fu fu functioning process. For example, in Charkhand, we have this Netarhat Vidyalaya, which is uh, a kind of modern day Gurukul in India, where learning is being encouraged in cooperation with the nature, where you're expected to learn close to the nature, where the scientific experiments, where various forms of uh, textual knowledges are being incorporated within the students in natural contexts. Uh, Sarang Hills in Kerala is another such kind of project. These are not exactly institutions, but they are kind of academic and knowledge production, the various projects of indigenous knowledge production, where the decentralization and the open schooling are taken as a collaborative learning process, where parents, students, and teachers all come together to build the systems or various systems of knowledge productions to first of all decolonize them and then try to create a platform, a depolarized platform where we can all stand on the same platform and we can agree to disagree with each other rather than generating hierarchies. And here small workshops are being organized like in Sarang Hills where parents with their children from different parts of the world, they come and join the workshops. They see how knowledge is being produced in the natural environment with uh, fields, with uh, agricultural practices, with planting trees, with painting in the nature, with various forms of cultural activities, academic activities taking close to nature, where basically the process of learning is being nurtured through regular habitual experiences rather than just for a few hours going to the school and reading a few books, sitting for an examination and coming back. And if we talk about different universities in India, like a few which are coming up and more are about to come who are breaking away from the colonially structured disciplines like humanities, social science. They are 
coming out of this colonial disciplinary compartments and recreating transitory multidisciplinary spaces. For example, if you see Ashoka University in New Delhi, Jindal Global University in Haryana, Avantika University in Madhya Pradesh, which is a design based, the first and till date, the only design based university in India, where basically they have the schools of uh, liberal arts and schools of very is multidisciplinary activities where faculties from, from different different knowledge based disciplines are coming under one umbrella and they're engaging and arguing and with each other over various various forms of knowledges rather than just being cocooned in one compartment they are coming up with new perspectives new ideas where the people from different disciplines students from different, different geographical spaces they come together on the same platform, get the scope of transdisciplinary interaction, get the scope of transdisciplinary collective knowledge production, which is again uh, some uh, again uh, a very important initiative which are being taken by these uh, universities. And in the near future, uh, such projects are about to come up in the form of universities, in the form of organizations, in the form of schools. So. Collective efforts are being made, are being undertaken in India towards uh, towards decolonizing the Indian academy from various parts. We also we are also seeing that uh, efforts are being made. The colonial academic, the colonial curriculum, curricular structures are being very much questioned right now in India. More and more uh, efforts are more and more pressure are being generated on the uh, government institutions to change the colonial knowledges to change put do away with the various colonial theoretical and the philosophical texts and give more focus on the indigenous texts in the indigenous languages as well as in the translated languages so these are some of the initiatives which are being taken and further initiatives are to be taken to uh, uh, decolonize the indian academia so this is it for today and uh, thank you so much once again to both of you for uh, giving me this opportunity to deliver this uh, lecture. Thank you so much.